Great. All right. Well, um, it's great to follow such an interesting talk. Um, this is going to be a pretty different topic. I don't do any online work. Um, yes. I guess maybe a little bit behind yes. in the times. <laughs> I do face-to-face, -face, largely qualitative and also epidemiological research. Um, and I would, thought I would talk today a little bit about some of the ethical and just broader human rights-based uh, considerations that I've grappled with in my own work um, with marginalized migrant women. Yeah, so I guess just to get started, um, because of barriers to conventional labor markets um, in destination settings, um, women who migrate um, who are more marginalized are often overrepresented in precarious employment. Uh, so this includes, for example, um, domestic work, uh, various types of under the table work, as well as the sex industry, which I'm going to focus on more in my presentation today. Um, and so when we're thinking about, um, in particular, migrant sex workers, um, a lot of research has shown, and I'll give you a few examples of this in a moment, um, that women face really immense uh, social and structural barriers to their health and safety. And the link here is that many of these also relate to um, how we do research with these groups because they create vulnerabilities in women's everyday lives that I think as researchers we need to be really cognizant of um, to do. Um, meaningful, relevant, and ethical research. So um, extreme social isolation, uh, language barriers, um, experiences of racialization and stigma, um, serious concerns around immigration status, um, as well as housing and working conditions, uh, violence, and limited access to justice and increased vulnerability to human rights violations. So I thought I would just take you through a little bit of the work that I had done prior to the Institute and then how it related to some of my MRP findings. Um, so I've been interested in um, migrant health for many years. Um, during my master's degree, I worked with migrant uh, oil and gas workers. Um, for my doctoral work, I did work around mobility and HIV um, in Latin America. And so this review, um, published many years ago, just spoke to some of the unique vulnerabilities faced by women, which increased my interest in this field. Um, and then I did some work looking at issues around migration um, and human trafficking related to the sex industry and HIV. And um, more recently have been working at the border between Mexico and Guatemala, focusing on um, issues of migration, safety and health um, for migrant sex workers. And so um, in another context where I'm currently working as well in Canada, interestingly enough, we see many of the same structural issues, albeit in a very different cultural and social context. Um, so with, in particular, criminalization, um, mainly on the basis of sex industry involvement, but also uh, concerns around immigration status, um, as well as really um, poor access to health care um, related to language barriers, um, stigma, and again, fear of police as um, really significant barriers to health and human rights. So because of this backdrop, I, um, I was very interested in doing my MRP, um, and it was more, it was broader, so it focused more broadly on issues faced by sex workers, but a lot of the sex workers in my MRP study were migrants, and as a bit of a sub-study following my main MRP paper that I worked on with the Institute, I came back last year and uh, presented kind of a sub-analysis looking at more of the immigration-related experiences of women, because this emerged as a really substantial concern in the focus groups and interviews that we did. So this was the article that we published recently, um, and I'll walk you through it a little bit, but essentially um, it was really about um, just, you know, what are these social and structural contexts and how can we understand them and, um, you know, develop strategies to address them to enhance the ethical conduct of research with this population. And so um, this was based on focus groups and in-depth interviews conducted with sex workers at the uh, border between Mexico and Guatemala had a fabulous cab uh, that met a few times during the study and provided really great input, um, kind of pre and post data collection, and uh, with whom we're still um, you know, conversing about new research directions. And I don't have time to present all the themes. I'm cognizant of the time and everybody else's presentations and thought I'd leave more room for the discussion, but I wanted to present two of the most powerful themes um, that emerged from this work. And, so the first theme related to immigration was really around um, concerns around mistrust and fear that um, were shown to be linked to the really high transience of this population, as well as the social isolation that resulted from that. So previously in my MRP and as other researchers have shown, the development of rapport um, and cultivation of really meaningful two-way relationships between um, research teams and participants is, I think, essential to um, you know, uh, feeling gratification with the research process, getting meaningful data, especially in qualitative research, but this has definitely been shown to be the case with epidemiological and intervention studies as well. 
Um, and <clears throat> an area that I've been interested in is, okay, well, how does this um, impact migrants, particularly because I'm interested in developing interventions with them, and we know that community aspect is so important, yet how do we even define community when we're talking about a population that's always on the move? So not surprisingly, that social isolation was shown to really result in a lot of mistrust and sometimes could prevent the development of rapport um, in ways that non-migrant women might have access to. Um, so for example, as one participant explained, you come here as a newcomer, you don't trust anyone, and you can't be talking about personal stuff. I think this can be a reason not to come here with you. So this is a recent migrant explaining her perspective. And then this was really shown to intersect with concerns, um, firstly related to women's legal immigration status um, as foreigners within the country, and secondly, um, the ways in which this also intersected with uh, policing around uh, sex work. There were lots of raids um, around the war on drugs, uh, sex trafficking, so many intersecting uh, policy and human rights issues that were going on in this community at the same time that created a lot of fear um, that was exacerbated for women who are not. Um, citizens of Guatemala. So in this concern, participants talked about how this um, related to concern that, you know, as researchers, and in particular for women who are newcomers who don't know us, could we be affiliated with these authorities that they fear that's probably their number one greatest fear in their day-to-day -day lives? Certainly more important than, you know, despite health being a big priority, this was really the big, big concern for women. And so as one participant explained, um, who is undocumented, you act private, you don't open up that much, because our fear is that they will send you back to your country with nothing. And this was, you know, when asked, you know, in an individual interview about her experiences um, with research participations and some of the barriers and facilitators. And a lot of women also talked about, and we included migrants and mi non-migrants in this analysis, because many of the women who were locals talked about how their peers who were not from there were afraid to get involved. So, for example, one woman talked about her peers saying they feel mistrust because migration just came and they're traumatized. This young girl who just arrived, I told her to come to that focus group that day, uh, but she was afraid that the police might show up. I told her there was no danger, but she said no. So just briefly, I think this work really speaks to the importance of procedures that address these migration related fears in research um, with this and similar populations. You know, I think we talk a lot about the cultural aspects and I think that's important and very much well deserved. But I think thinking more about the legal and social aspects around uh, immigration status is also essential. And certainly there are some migrant health researchers um, here in the US that have done this. But I think in global health, um, there's a lot less understanding of these issues, particularly for researchers who aren't from that context, who might not have a lot of time in the community. I think just more familiarity with these local human rights and policy contexts is really essential. And I think one of the best ways to do this is certainly, um, you know, long-standing community-based partnerships. So really getting to know the people in the community where you work, working with frontline organizations that understand how to address these issues, ideally peer-based designs, but I will say that that's a challenge in migrant health research because I've been trying to identify peers in these communities for the last three years and it's, it's very different than working in other contexts. So that's a piece we're still grappling with and I have a student working on that right now. Um, and I think in general, this also links to the need, you know, this isn't just, you know, a research ethics issue or even a research issue. This is a broader human rights issue. And so um, I think, you know, this would definitely be helped by broader interventions that are really looking at addressing the health, social support and human rights of migrant women. So it can't be disentangled from that broader context. So I'll stop there with um, just an acknowledgement slide and just invite discussion, comments, questions. I don't know if any of you are dealing with migration related issues in your MRPs, but if you are, I'd be excited to discuss them. Thanks. Um, I have not heard of any cases in this particular context where women who were experiencing exploitation were well served by the current justice system. So regardless of what the act, like the legal entitlements might be, the reality was that it would normally be, you would be in a detention center, you would lose your income, you would lose your human rights and your agency, and then you would eventually be maybe released to your home country, maybe released to the country that you were still in, but usually in a worse off position than you had been before. So yeah. certainly a lot of work still needs to be done in that area. In Elizabeth's work with you guys, there was 
also pointing out that sometimes there are statistics like other people, which is the only way they're allowed to stay in the country, which yeah. is a risk to them as well. So Certainly that's the case in the United States. Yeah. Can I ask a question about um, a, a number of our, this year's fellows are doing qualitative research yeah. um, or quantitative, trying to elicit this sense of trust. Yeah. So you got that. But how did, did you allow it to do spontaneously? Did you use the word trust in your questions? How, how do you get at that? And did you find that there are approaches to it that can allow for its emergence by itself, but also the probes that might be necessary? I think my experience has been more that it's something that emerges by itself when you're having a real conversation with somebody that's nuanced where you have a skilled interviewer or facilitator. Um, I think it can sometimes be hard in focus groups, so sometimes it's easier to get at those deeper nuances and one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, but I think it takes an interviewer really picking up on a participant describing instances or using other language to describe situations in, they, in which they might have not felt trust or in which they had a great rapport with a staff member that they're describing, for example. But for me, I think it usually emerged in that way. I don't know that we use the specific word trust, but for sure, like for example, within Latin American culture, like, like platica or just like talking and, you know, there are many other ways that people will discuss related issues in terms of how rapport is built. And so our interviewers were, you know, thinking about that and they needed to understand very well like the context of the project and what we really wanted to know to be able to do that successfully. So I'd say if you're not doing the interviews and the focus groups yourself, then make sure your team, if you're not gonna use words like that, that they really understand that that's important to you. But I've heard a few people already say that that's like the main focus of your MRP. And if it is, I would have questions and probes using the word and then I would have questions and probes that use maybe exemplars, you know, or, or other ways of getting at it. And, pilot test your interview guide and see what works. It seems like a place your PFP opinion leaders, because you raise a great point if you're working with different language populations or different cultural populations, yeah. whether they speak English or not, finding out what are different ways that issues of trust are articulated yeah. in these different populations, or Absolutely. what are the behaviors that, that are there. I think yeah. that's, a, you know, that's really great advice. Yeah, and I would also run it by the cab. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, I, I yeah. Okay, key opinion. Yeah. 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 I like I sure. what uh, Sarah was saying. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Is there any question? I, I have a, a naive question because yeah. I'm just not uh, educated in this space. But no, it's so a quick. What's the motivation, you know, for, the, for migration? Yeah. Sort of. So. Thank you, I should have mentioned that. Yeah. It's supposed to be part of my background. I didn't have the, the okay. notes here. Yeah, so um, so the motivation for migration in this case, as we found with the similar populations even in Canada, is, is pretty much um, almost all the time economic. Um, it's you, Most of these women have children um, either with them in the destination or many prefer to leave them at home because they have a grandmother taking care of them, plus a stigma around sex work. Sometimes women want to have their families far removed. Um, so yeah, I would say that supporting their family is the number one reason. Um, we did see some so cases, not in this. Okay, to be, to be, to do their work. Yes, but they don't necessarily know that they were going to do this work. So a lot of it has to do with the barriers to conventional labor markets. And right. so women, right. you know, arrive in a country that might right. have more options than where they left, or at least are, is perceived to have more options. Right. Uh, for example, a lot of women in this context in Guatemala, you don't think of as a destination country, but compared to Nicaragua and Honduras, yeah. um, it, it very much is so. Migrating and so migrating for a better life, um, yeah. I would say a very small proportion had done sex work before, but most that was just what they were able to find when they got there. Or yeah, I don't think we saw that in the study, but in another study we had done in this context, a small handful were, yeah, had been. But still, it's that's it's that's a whole other conversation. It becomes so complicated. But you know, despite that history, most of them were kind of fine with the work that they were doing now and more just wanted this police to stop harassing them and just be able to do their work in peace as opposed to have, you know, foreigners come save them from trafficking. So it's a complicated discourse for sure. Right. And, and do, um, do the, these women come, I mean, is it a, do they migrate with their families? I mean, or is it, so I'm thinking about the, um, in New Hampshire, and yeah. Vermont, um, which I didn't realize, there's a huge migrant yeah. Um, and uh, that actually have, you know, significant 
can yeah. help them. Yeah. And help needs. And they and I hadn't thought about the women. Yeah. And so Yeah. Yeah, it definitely depends on the context. Like in Vancouver right now, we're working in massage parlors uh, primarily with women who are coming from Asian um, countries of origin. And a lot of them do come with their families or they've married a spouse in Canada. For some, that was a pathway to immigration status. Um, And for them, the family issue, having the family in town is one of the biggest barriers to health and to research participation because they're afraid that their work will be disclosed to their family through like a raid on their workplace or even admitting the work that they're doing on a survey. And so we have so many parts in the survey where we stop and explain that we're not affiliated with government or police, that this is why we're doing this, but it's it's an ongoing challenge our our massage parlor team faces weekly. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you.